So now we're going to move on and talk about rock failure. And that's really the point of, you know, this is sort of where we're going uh, with, you know, first doing some uh, stress resolution, you know, to de so that we can determine what, you know, th what the actual stress is in the rock in a given coordinate system. And, you know, we've, we've already done stress resolution on faults. Uh, very soon we're going to talk a lot about, we're going to spend a lot of time about wellbores. And that's sort of, wellbores are, are sort of the fundamental application of residual geomechanics. So we're going to talk a lot about wellbore stability. And so we'll also resolve stresses in the wellbore. And then with that, we'll, given what we know or what we're going to learn about how rocks fail, then we'll be able to determine if the wellbores are stable or not. Or, or, or things we can do to enhance wellbore stability, okay? And so, uh, you know, we've talked about how rocks behave elastically, right? And now we're going to talk about how they fail, right? Or when they fail. And we're going to describe some simple models uh, that can hopefully help us predict when a rock will fail, okay? And so, you know, the first thing we have to do is understand the types of tests on rocks, and you, you guys have already done a few of these in your lab, uh, and you'll do some more uh, in the next few weeks. But let's just get it clear, uh, some terminology, because I'll talk about when, when, and I already probably have used this before, when we talk about a hydrostatic compression test. So a hydrostatic compression test is a scenario like the one I described earlier, where your sample is basically put into a bath of fluid. And the fluid is intensified such that the sample is squeezed on all sides equally. Okay? And I, you know, here I have a cylindrical sample. I mean, that's, that's typical or core type sample. But you could also have you know, other shapes, cubes or you know, rectangulars, and, you know, things that are easy to make, essentially. Uh, so the cores are some of the, some of the easiest sort of samples to make with rocks. So the hydrostatic fluid is typically like, you know, the, some type of oil, kerosene, and then you have a large intensifier that can really, pr that can pressurize the fluid to really high pressures, okay? So you can squeeze the rock on all sides. So that's a hydrostatic compression test. So a uniaxial compression test, this is one you've done, certainly you did it in the first lab, right? So in the uniaxial compression test, uh, I don't know if I even need to explain it to you since you've all actually done one, but essentially the sample is unconfined and you squeeze on it from one end okay, until it fails. And this is probably the most common data out there. You, you get, there's lots of unconfined compressive strengths. And, you know, particularly, um, you know, like in civil engineering where you deal with concrete a lot and building roads and bridges and, and buildings with concrete, I mean, it, it's sort of the, the characteristic test. When you talk about the, you know, the quality of a concrete, you talk about its unconfined compressive strength, or it's, it's, you know, it's designed to a certain unconfined compressive strength. But it's actually a pretty useless measurement, uh, because you know, it's very rare that any material, a rock certainly, a rock that we care about in a reservoir, is never unconfined. Never. Right? It's always under confined. And you know, even even in a civil engineering application, the road, a bridge, building, you know, in, in any given sort of characteristic material sample in an actual application has significant confinement around it. You know, it may be it may have one free surface, the edge of the building or something, right, or the top of the road, but it has significant material around it that would have to be, you know, any sort of characteristic sample size would be surrounded by lots of material, and so there's always some type of lateral confinement. And so it's, it's really not that valuable a measurement, yet it's unfortunately the most common one we do because it's the easiest one to collect. And, and then, of course, uh, you know, you have to have specialized, pretty specialized testing equipment to test the other types of tests we're going to talk about, including the hydrostatic compression. Right? And so uh, a triaxial compression, the, the name is a little bit of a misnomer because you're not actually, I mean, this is the standard name. We're going to say triaxial compression. It's a little bit of a misnomer, though, because uh, triaxial would imply that in three different axes, you're applying three different loads, right? 
but in what we typically call triaxial compression, again, the sample is placed in a fluid bath and surrounded by fluid on, on the sides, okay? So surrounded by fluid on the sides, but then mechanically loaded from the top and the bottom. Right? So just like in an act, just like in the uniaxial test that we did, you have a, a, a load frame or a stage that moves to squeeze the sample. So this would be the same idea in a triaxial compression test. You have a load frame or a stage that squeezes the sample from the ends, and, it, and only from the sides is it laterally confined with, with fluid. Okay. So it's not a true triaxial test because two of the two of the principal stresses, two of the directions are the same, right? Because you're squeezing on all sides, right? Not not the top and the bottom, but the sides of the sample. You're squeezing equally, right? So and, and obviously compression implies squeezing, right? Squeezing. Okay. So pushing on the sample. So that's the triaxial compression test. These tests are useful, and we'll see why very soon. They're probably the most useful types of tests to do on a rock. Okay. So then we have triaxial extension. Also a little bit of a mis misnomer in a couple of ways. Again, it's not truly triaxial. So now, now you, you, know, you have the same pressure bath applied to the sides. So it's not true triaxial test. But it's also very hard to grip a rock and, and extend it, right, to pull on it. Extension implies pulling, right? So that's very hard to do. And most rocks are very brittle if you actually put them into true tension. And therefore, they, they would break almost immediately if they're in true tension. Okay. So what, what we actually do in a triaxial extension test is as we apply the hydrostatic load, so as we squeeze it from the sides, we also squeeze it from the top at the same rate and at the same pressure. right? So we sort of mimic, at least initially, the first part of the test. We mimic a hydrostatic compression test. Right? So we, we, we ramp up the fluid pressure bath. We squeeze the sample from the sides. At the same rate and same intensity, we squeeze the sample from the top so that at the, in, at the beginning of the test, the sample is in hydrostatic compression. Same load applied to all sides. Same stress applied to all sides. Okay, so now the sample is in compression, and now we start the real test. And what we do there is we actually release the compression axial. Right. So while we call it extension, it, it might be called like compressive release. <laughs> Triaxial compressive release test would probably be uh, a better name for it. Right. So so we squeeze the sample until it's under hydrostatic compression. And then we release the load on the end until the sample fails. Okay. And so that's a hydrostatic uh, extension test. Um, basically, usually any any apparatus that can do a hydrostatic compression test can also do this test. So they're they're also fairly you know if you have the equipment then they're, they're not too much trouble to do. Uh, and then the last one is the true triaxial test. Now these are aren't very common because it's very hard to do these, but you know, here you have to have a very specialized load frame that can re truly apply basically unique stresses in three directions. Okay, and so you're you can't apply the axial load with a hydrostatic bath anymore, right? A, a pressure bath because that's just going to apply an equal load to all sides. So you have to have some type of load frame that's multi-axial, right? which is fairly you know you could do it in a lab setting if it's a really small load frame, like like the ones in, in our lab, you know, you could have multiple axes, like the ones in the, in the geomechanic class laboratory, right? You could have small axes and stuff. The problem is, is that the samples that you guys are using in that class, those are on the very sort of low end of what you can get by with in terms of so sample size. Because most rocks, sedimentary rocks and everything, very heterogeneous. And you want to have a sample size that's big enough that it characterizes, in an average sense, the real response of the material. And so if you have lots of sort of large aggregates in your, in your rock, you need large samples. And so, you know, like a shale or something like that, you can get by with fairly small sample sizes, which means you can get by with fairly small load frames. 
But if you go to you know, fairly large you know, samples, uh, like a weather grid or something that will have lots of different larger size aggregates, and probably you'd want to characterize sample sizes large enough that they had um, sort of good flaw distributions. Because rocks also fail basically through a, through a coalescence of flaws in the material. I mean, all rocks have small micro cracks and other things that are much smaller than the sample size you see. And so you'd want those to be sort of uniformly distributed throughout a sample. So you need a fairly large sample size. And something like a weathered granite or something, you need, you need large samples. And so you need large testing equipment to be able to break those samples. And to have large testing equipment that's capable of doing these type of tests is you know, pretty difficult, takes up a lot of space, very expensive. All right. So turns out you know, with, with the data we can collect in those type of tests, we can 